Okay, we've been having some issues with the sound. Um, I've made an adjustment now. Is that is that all right? Yeah, I'm hearing some confirmations that that's okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> I'll just go over that again. Basically, what we're looking at here in the uh, in the US 30 is that we're in a range-bound market, and the typical scenario, the highest probability scenarios in a range-bound market are to be buying near the bottom of the range, selling near the top of the range. And obviously, we've got through various uh, various levels of resistance on the, this strong trend higher, um, confounding those who were calling for a sell-off all the way up. We've got through the 18,000 mark, but we've run into this area of resistance here around the 18200 mark and the next one in question is obviously the record peak in around that 18360 area and uh, to me given how far we've come I think actually there's a good chance we push into a new record uh, but I'm not convinced we can get much further beyond that I think you know maybe it needs um, a fresh record to really have a Lots of people who were calling for a bear market to completely 180 their opinion, um, jump into the market a um, bit full-heartedly. And if you are not just day trading for a few points, but if you're holding on for the longer term and you're buying up around these levels, um, any small correction in the market, you know, you're going to be the weaker hand, you're going to be selling out, and that's going to add to the downside. So I think that's going to happen in the not-too-distant future. But just because we've had this bearish engulfing candlestick on the daily chart from that highlighted resistance zone, that's the first sign of weakness. But we're getting a little bit of a rebound off the previous peak here, um, so we're not done and dusted yet. Really, this short-term uptrend is intact, in my opinion, while we're above this Monday 18th low, as I mentioned in the, uh, the chart forum here. Uh, other thing to, rem to, to remember is we do have some bearish um, divergence in the RSI. Um, obviously, it's not played out yet. Uh, we keep tracking higher in the price as this RSI keeps tracking lower. I think maybe if we try and make another swing, possibly pushing up above that previous high, but we can't do so again in the RSI, that'd be a fourth time fail. That could be the one that we need. Now, obviously, a pretty clear-cut resistance in, in the U.S. markets, but uh, similar in, in the U.K. and Europe, but just not as, uh, not as close to the records. So this is the um, our proxy for the FTSE, obviously, the U.K. 100, uh, 100. <clears throat> and you can see we've perfectly bounced off the 200-week moving average here with what is basically as, far, as best as Forex can, can pull off, um, sorry, as best as sort of uh, futures markets can pull off is a, um, as, as like a shooting star reversal where we push pretty high into the week and end up closing pretty close to where we opened. And we're starting to roll over this week. Now you can see that, um, you know, the technicals have been playing their role. We had that first jam higher. We pulled away from the, you know, we closed in at this previous peak, we dropped back a bit, and then we moved up to the 200 week moving average again, uh, and then uh, we pulled down. So this seems to be having more of an impact, uh, probably because there's a confluence of resistance around the 6450 area of these previous peaks uh, from back in October and November. Then if we jump over to the Germany 30, you can see that there's been this pretty prolonged pivot that's worked a few times in the 16500 area where it's a peak here, low here, we gapped down right into it here in January, and then as it gave way, that was the big sell-off, and now we're back there again. And it's just above the 200-day uh, moving average, which is supportive, and I think, you know, Going, dipping back beneath the 200, coming down to this resistance again, um, and potential support at 10,120 does minimize how effective that is going to be as a support because that's almost a fail break. Well, it is a fail break of the 200 day moving average if we drop down below it after just a few days above. So if we do end up closing today or tomorrow below the 200-day moving average, I think there's a good chance we see a steeper pullback towards this, um, this rising trend line again. But still, 
keep in mind the trend the trend is higher i mean i i, I just monitor the above the 200 day moving average and 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 higher lows and higher highs on the weekly chart we're we're fitting both those criteria so it's it's lower probability trades uh, to be shorting in that environment but nonetheless you've got to be cognizant of this pivot level which i think is is going to perhaps cause a bit more damage particularly if we get uh, close below that 200 day moving average So I've covered major equities there. Um, I'm going to switch over to, to FX just because, as I mentioned, um, the two big events this week are the, the Bank of Japan and uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve. Fed, on, Fed first on Wednesday, Bank of Japan on, on Thursday. <clears throat> and uh, the Fed more than likely going to, to hold pat. Um, you know, there is some of the, the Fed speakers that we've heard have tried to keep uh, April on the table, but I think the, the comments that you really need to pay attention to come from uh, Miss Yellen herself, the Fed chair, and she pretty much put the kibosh on uh, on April. And given her sort of uh, you know her desire to to be cautious in the current environment, you know I think there's a good chance that uh, June's off the table, and I think we're pricing about 20% in markets at the moment, looking at Fed funds futures of a hike in June. So pretty unlikely anything's going to actually happen at this meeting. Um, but there could be a, a shift in language. Um, you know, it was fairly cautious last time, and obviously, like I said, markets are pricing a 20% chance in June. Um, if the Fed actually do want to do, uh, if they actually do want to hike in June, um, which they, they, they could do, based on, on domestic data, the key domestic data, looking at infl employment and, um, uh, and inflation, um, they, they really could be justified in, in another hike. You know, um, then they're going to have to try and readjust market expectations, and they're going to have to do that through the language. So a chance that the, uh, the Fed go a little bit more neutral, a little bit more hawkish than the previously fairly dovish statement. I mean, at the end of the day, Part of why they didn't hike last time was was worries in financial markets and uh, concerned over global growth. Well, China's government has been stepping up the support, running a fiscal deficit, um, running fiscal stimulus programs, cutting the interest rates, not quite so recently, but still a series of cuts taking place in China. So China has veered towards supporting growth in the near terms and not such a not such concerns on global growth, and as we just looked at that US 30 chart, we're pretty much close to record territory in stock markets. So neither of those two concerns are really there, and they're pretty close on the inflation target, and they're already there on the unemployment target. So running out of reasons not to hike, and that's probably not entirely being considered by markets at the moment. <laughs> that said, how can you really play this in, in the um, in the euro? You know, I think maybe you start to factor in a bit more divergence in the, um, the, the you know, the, the policy of the ECB and the Fed again. Even though the ECB are on hold, you know, they have just recently um, eased policy. That didn't affect the euro so much because it was believed the Fed were going to be so dovish. If they're not, then the euro has some room to come back down um, into this trading range. And we saw, you know, we highlighted it at the time, this bearish engulfing candlestick um, at the, the top of the trading range. And uh, it followed through the, ne the next week. Obviously, you know, it a, it's, it's pretty easy to engulf a, um, a doji candlestick, but nonetheless, it was there and it was at the prior resistance. So when you put those two together, it's quite strong. It's followed through. And uh, you know, if we if we take out last week's low, you know, I think there's a good chance we basically push back into the middle of this 105 to 110 trading range. Um, you know, in a trading range, you know, you bounce, if you do get a successful bounce off the top, next target's the middle. If you get through the middle, you you know, you're you're on track to hit the bottom. The general guideline. The middle here is roughly 110, um, and you can see from these weekly peaks that actually 110 is pretty solid. Um, but you, you know, just judging, if you see more clearly on based on a daily chart, you would say maybe the 11060, just based on these these areas here, and it's still pretty close to that flat 200-day moving average, which you could also use to define the middle. 
So um, good chance we, we, we drop down further here. Um, but it's, you know, there, there may be speculation going into the meeting or, um, you know, that big move could happen as a result of the meeting. You, but technically, it looks like we're, we're, we're turning lower within the range. Now, obviously, just switching away from central banks momentarily, well, slightly, <clears throat> Um, you know, obviously, the Brexit debate is dominating what's happening with sterling, and um, there's just been a number of um, key figures and institutions coming out on the side of the Remain campaign. And while that was obviously going to happen all along, it's obviously the um, <clears throat> the establishment wants us to remain in the EU, that's fairly obvious, and so all the institutions are going to say that they want us to stay, as is America. Um, but Obama, um, obviously a pretty high-profile figure, um, one of the few people that your average um, member of the Joe, Pub uh, you know, Joe public can recognize in terms of politicians, um, you know, going up against Boris Johnson, Obama's up there. And uh, you know, the, the pound is breaking higher, not saying just because of Obama, uh, but also the Treasury's reports, um, the you know, various European um, officials coming out in favor, obviously. Uh, it's just all of that put together just minimizes the chance of um, a Brexit actually, actually taking place. Um, to my mind, I've said from the start that it's, uh, it's, it just seems obvious to me that, um, you know, the bulk of the population is going to vote for the status quo. Um, you know, the economy's ticking along. We're doing okay. You know, most people are going to take the opinion without doing too much research into the um, democratic pros and cons of being in Europe. They're just going to say, well, how, you know, how comfortable do we feel right now? Well, you know, why risk that? And, um, and we'll end up remaining. <laughs> And so this heavy sell-off that we had in the pound as people really started getting us worried about Brexit um, is starting to come out of the market. And we've broken this declining trend line here, which is quite well defined. Um, it's kind of, uh, you know, you'd, it'd almost need to be a thick trend line to kind of work through this low as well. But you can see we paused here. We broke through uh, last week and we're pushing higher again this week. But, you know, important to be aware of the kind of overall situation is a bit like the euro. We are kind of still in a range, so we've got that, that peak up there, but you could, you know, maybe just draw a line through this previous peak, which we're just coming up to around the round 145 number, and people could just, just like down here, where we had a false break lower, um, you know, we could get a little false break above 145, where people get really excited about this trend line break, and we just roll over, because we're in the trading range still. So according to the down trend line, we've got a break higher, but we are still well below the 200-day moving average, and um, you know, it's a mixed picture in terms of highs and lows um, on the weekly chart. So then, just looking at dollar yen, obviously we've got that Bank of Japan. You know, we saw a sharp move higher last week um, on Friday that took us way back above that 111. Resistance and has taken us nicely into that um, that 50-day uh, moving average, um, just short of the 112 level, and uh, and just near this this previous low here where we broke down that began that big sharp descent um, on on the idea that um, the Bank of Japan is going to offer negative rates for for lending, um, so basically pay banks to lend, which is obviously fairly extreme. But Bank of the Bank of Japan uh, is no, you know, is not not shown itself to be shy of extreme policies. Um, there have been figures out today how um, the Bank of Japan actually are um, top ten shareholders in in most of the Nikkei 225 stocks. So obviously getting to a fairly ridiculous state of affairs where the central bank is a major shareholder in the Japanese stock market. Uh, so they're not afraid of extreme measures. And, um, and so expectations are ramping up that they're going to do something um, to basically, if we scale out, address this situation. You know, we've, we've topped out here. We've, you know, we've, uh, we've put in that head and shoulders formation. We're correcting. And um, I was, uh, you know, I was of the opinion 
that um, the Bank of Japan are not going to really try and intervene um, until we get through 105. Um, and I, th and may you know, maybe there's you know, obviously the um, the market's pushed higher already, and um, we've come down a lot. So there's room for correction, but I think there's still a chance that maybe we come away from this disappointed that the Bank of Japan don't do enough. And obviously, keep in mind that um, the last few attempts from central banks to cut rates further into the negative resulted in that the said currency going higher, you know, looking specifically at the euro. Um, and the whole thing was kind of kicked off by the Bank of Japan when they first turned negative. The result was for dollar yen to drop. So, um, you know, if they try and push on this uh, further again, you know, maybe maybe the result is that dollar yen drops. And so that's actually the yen appreciating instead of depreciating as if uh, dollar yen were to go higher. Yeah, we can have a look at uh, uh, sterling yen for sure. Um, sterling yen is obviously an interesting one because you, you're kind of matching up, um, uh, you know, the, the failure of the Bank of Japan to, to hold up the yen um, and you're looking at Brexit. But obviously those two ties have sort of turned a little bit recently. <clears throat> Similar looking chart to, um, to dollar yen. Um, still, as far as I'm concerned, just looking at the, um, the weekly chart, you know, we've we've made a lower low here, though only just, and um, we're still in making lower highs. So trends still strictly speaking down, but obviously um, the the speed of it has, um, you know, we've lost some momentum, and you can see that pretty clear cut in the um, uh, bullish divergence in the RSI. But we're still below 50, so. <clears throat> Keep in mind, we've had a big, good push higher, but there are going to be people selling into that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we're getting close to a possible breakout here, but remember with this sort of overall trend direction lower, um, there's risk that, that that breakout gets faded. And I would, I would suggest that probably the high probability trade, when we do get breaks of, you know, I guess what you're kind of looking at is this trend line, which we've had a little break up now. So first sign that things are kind of looking good there. So that's going to be attracting a few people along the market. We get above 106.45, that's going to attract a few people, more people in. Um, 106, 164, going to attract a few more people in. Um, so how far, how many people do we have to attract long sterling yen for all the people that were buying down here at the, the smart money buying at the lows before they unload the sterling they've been buying. Um, and so, you know, if you all those buying on the breakout, you know, that, that buying is, is, is useful for those uh, those who are who bought down here at are selling. And what, like I said, while the trend is against you, uh, you know, I would just suggest that, you know, we can't probably get much, much before, much above 164 without rolling over. <coughs> um, but, you know, that's not to say we come and make fresh lows. That's just to say that, you know, we could get a push back below 160 um, before being before it was a safer opportunity to, to try and call a bottom. Safe, when I say safer, I just mean lower risk because, you you know, you, if you are putting your stop beneath the low, then, you know, obviously the lower you're buying it, the less risk you're taking. I hope that, uh, I hope that helps. And then uh, switching gears to the, the metals markets, I, met, um, I mentioned, but it may have been when the sound wasn't working at the start, that we've run into a few resistance areas on the, the equities, which we've already looked at. We've also been running in them, into them on, on metals. Um, silver, not one that I always cover, but one of the most obvious last week was where we ran into that 1780, um, 1778 really on our charts, um, which was the peak from, from pretty much a year ago, uh, 11 months ago. And we got a really big jump last week, but then a pretty sharp reversal too, um, which to some extent the reversal is understandable because we ran into that peak and it was just such a big move higher you know, anyone who's long silver is good. You know, you can imagine a lot will be, wow, we've had a great week. Let's take our profits. Um, you know, let's not push our luck. 
because you know for a move of um you know almost two dollars in silver you know you normally expect to wait longer than a week so that said i think the situation is still pretty favorable we've still got this um this sort of wedge breakout that we're dealing with but i think there's a chance that we pull back maybe to the 1635 area before we can um you know even 16 before we can attract some people back in the market again to, to, to go long after these this pretty sharp reversal last week <clears throat> Um, well, let's just have a look at gold. Uh, you know, similar fit to gold, um, you know, the question has been, are we going to get a break above resistance? Well, fake out there, or are we going to get a break through the support? Well, no, we've not managed to get down to it yet. Um, a very choppy looking head and shoulders pattern, perhaps. Left shoulder, head, right shoulder, but obviously we've got the false, you know, that was looking like it was going to get undone on Friday. Uh, no, was it Thursday? Uh, but then we got the false breakout and turned lower again on Friday. So at the moment, you know, looking for possible bound downside break. But gold has has been pretty resilient. It's just been in this choppy range, while equities have been pushing higher. You know, if if gold was just purely mirroring equities, you would expect it to have rolled over by now. But actually, it seems like uh, even pe people are buying into this equity um, rally. But uh, but also hedging it with safer assets like gold. Mm -hmm. Or the other opinion, obviously, is that a lot of the rally is just um, is uh, <coughs> companies buying back their own stock and actually outflow. There's just been ongoing outflows out of equity funds, and so actually investors are pulling their money out of the market while corporates are buying their own stock, pushing the market higher, um, which can only last for so long. And actually, investors are buying things like gold. Uh, and obviously, importantly, oil, we were down about 2% odd this morning. Um, and so, you know, now we're flat again. That's pretty typical action these days. Of swings are around 4% in oil. Um, Brent, I think, one of the clearest cuts to look at, you know, we're running into this support turned resistance at, um, at 46, 46 on our charts. And so we've had a series of almost inside days here. Um, on, on Brent, and so that's a good scenario for, for a breakout. The last time, the last two times, I suppose, that that's happened, we had kind of two-ish low momentum days there, resolved to the downside, and then we had uh, sort of about three low momentum uh, days to the downside, um, so two, three momentum, low momentum days just below this uh, former support term resistance here at 42. That eventually turned to the downside. So recent history suggests these low volatility days and involve a drop. But the difference being now that we are above the 200 day moving average, which um, you know, does kind of change the dynamic, keeps people a bit more uh, bullish on it. <clears throat> um, do, do, do. Got a, got a just for any of those interested. Got a little question here about why crude price is different. Um, <clears throat> I we offer so we offer different prices. So here on my uh, my um, product list, I've got crude cash. Um, so that's just um, we've normalised this price um, to account for to, to make it like a current price for oil. So we basically kind of remove the the discounting that you get in futures prices. So that's that's the Brent cash price. So the difference here is that you um, you can pay and roll over your contract um, just like you would in, in forex. Whereas we do also have, if I just type in Brent up here, um, we've got our futures contracts here rolling out several months ahead. But you know, mostly you mostly we're getting we're not you know we're not um, very far into the June contract now. <clears throat> So here you can try the, the June contract, and you can see that this price should should more closely reflect what you see generally quoted because it's the front month futures price. The other cash price is, is adjusted. The reason I use the other one is I like to be able to place a trade and, and, and not have to think about when the expiry is. This expires in June. Uh, and also, if you're doing some longer-term technical analysis, um, the, the, the cash price chart um, uh, extends further back. Not, uh, that said, you can always do your longer-term technical analysis on the cash chart, 
and then trade on the on the futures chart and um, just be savvy to the fact that it does expire. And you know, just check in the um, the product overview panel there for um, for when it does expire to have it noted in your diary. <laughs> Hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're pretty much um, we're at the end here. Um, I hope that was helpful to everyone. Uh, should be a fun week with the central banks. Uh, obviously, still U.S. earnings. We've got apples of results out tomorrow, so that should cause a few waves. Uh, we've got a few U.K. bank earnings out this week as well. So um, a fair bit going on. So good luck with the trading with it, and uh, see you again next week. Jasper Lawler signing out.